From GMB to IPCC, Laura Tobin shares her climate saving tips. We have only recycled 9% of all plastic that's ever been made, 9%. Paddling safe, some timely advice for those heading to the beach. It's very, very easy to get on an inflatable and to get taken out to sea. And the oldest object in the meteorological archive. Externally, it's nothing very special to look at. The inside is a whole different story. It's Friday, the 15th of April, and you're listening to Weathersnap from the Met Office. Hello, I'm Alex Deakin, and this is Weathersnap, an insider's guide to the week's weather headlines. Rescue teams continue to provide support for communities hit by flooding and landslides in the Philippines. This as the country recovers from the devastating effects of Tropical Storm Meggy. With more details on this and other global weather events, here's Dave Oliver of the Met Office Global Guidance Unit. Heavy rainfall had been affecting the Philippines from Wednesday the 6th of April, uh, this continuing through last weekend. The source of this rainfall was a system which then developed into Tropical Depression Meggy, or Agaton, as known locally in the Philippines. This developed in the Philippine Sea, close to the eastern coast of the Samar province, on Sunday the 10th of April when it was named. This was a relatively weak tropical depression in terms of winds. Mean wind speeds were around 40 miles per hour with gusts of around 50 or so. Uh, but the main impact from this was very heavy rainfall across the central part of the Philippines over the course of Sunday and Monday. On both days, uh, some sites across the islands reported 24-hour rainfall in excess of 150 millimetres, some places 170 mils. So this rainfall caused some pretty significant impacts. Uh, the system itself moved offshore and dissipated on Tuesday and Wednesday, leaving behind a few showers, but a, a lot drier conditions since then. Moving across to South Africa, some localised but very extreme rainfall has been seen across parts of the country over the last couple of days. Subtropical storm Isa formed close to the coast of the KwaZulu-Natal province on Tuesday night and into Wednesday. Uh, this brings some very heavy rain to coastal areas of this province of South Africa. Some reports in the region are suggesting that some areas have had their annual rainfall in just 48 hours. Dave Oliver, expert operational meteorologist with the Global Guidance Unit. Climate change is a common feature of the news headlines. And here at Weathersnap, we provide regular updates on the latest climate science. The complexity and far-reaching effects of climate change means it can be tempting to think that there's not much we can do as individuals. A new book, Everyday Ways to Save the Planet, aims to address this and suggests practical tips on how we can all play our part. The title's author is Laura Tobin, weather presenter with ITV's Good Morning Britain. And here she explains the thinking behind the book to climate correspondent Graham Match. Laura, we've known you as a, a weather forecaster. You're very familiar on our screens on Good Morning Britain. How much did you understand about climate as a weather forecaster? Do you know, probably very little, actually. At university, I did physics and meteorology at Reading, and we had maybe one or two climate modules. And it was something that we touched on when I joined the Met Office as a forecaster when I was doing my training. But it was more looking at extremes and how the weather had changed over a long period of time. So now, you've just written a book, Everyday Ways to Save Our Planet. What was the inspiration behind that book? I think that in the last, I guess, four or five years, I've noticed as a weather forecaster how much more I'm reporting on extreme weather events, how much more reporting on extreme weather events around the world, how much more we're seeing extreme temperatures in the UK. And that's when I just thought, you know, I can talk about it all I want, but I think the next step is to help people to be able to make a difference and actually see if individual changes will make a difference. And do you know what? It turns out they do. <laughs> What's been the biggest single wake up call to you that our climate is changing? I think for me, it was a very fortunate trip that I got to go to Svalbard. So Svalbard is an archipelago, a little island north of Norway in the Arctic Circle. And we always talk about how the Earth is warming and how the Arctic is warming twice or three times as fast as the rest of the world. Well, Svalbard is warming nearly six times faster than anywhere else on planet Earth. And because of that, you can see the impacts of climate change 
really rapidly and really vividly right before your eyes. I saw the reality of standing a mile away from the end of a glacier. And this guy showed me and said, 40 years ago, that glacier ended here. And now it's a mile up the hill. And it was 10 metres high. And this huge volume of ice had been lost from this one glacier. And that was every glacier in the whole of the island. And then I came back from that trip and thought, wow, you know, when my daughter, if she were to go there when she was my age, it would look unrecognisable, potentially no glaciers at all. What do you think families can do to actually try and avert climate change? Do you know, my my tagline is no one can do everything. Everyone can do something. And yes, you can look at what other people are doing, other countries, other nations, anyone down your street and say, well, they haven't done this. They haven't done that. They've not recycled. But, you know, you have to just do what you can do. One massive one is tackling food waste. That is 10% of all of the world's emissions. So planning our meals better, not throwing stuff away, freezing if we've got too much food. And actually, it's something that's really easy. Not only is it free, it will save you money. And I think that's the big thing. So saving the planet in these changes are going to bring so much more benefits to you than negatives. On your journey, when you were preparing the book, what was the biggest thing that leapt out to you as a surprise that you didn't know before? Ah, how bad we are at recycling. (laughs) Recycling should be the last thing we should do. We should live in a circular economy and use our coffee cups again and wash them. And we have only recycled 9% of all plastic that's ever been made. 9%. That is crazy. So 91% of plastic that's ever been made has been thrown away and is in a landfill or in oceans. So that is why there is an entire section called Recycle Right. And it seems really obvious, but if we could tackle that and just think about what we're throwing into the correct bins and not just wish cycling and standing at the bin thinking, oh, I'll throw that in and hope we can recycle that. And then you can't and it contaminates the whole waste and it goes to landfill anyway. Recycling Right blew my mind and I have tried very hard to do it correctly. Your four-year-old daughter features heavily in the book. What do you think for the future and what do you think your book will achieve? Well, I have a big letter at the start, which I write to her to say, I'm sorry for different things that we're doing, for overusing our planet, for knowing what we're doing and not making changes. But I, I hope that we will listen to the science and I hope that we can make the changes. And I hope that she will see the world as it is now, not underwater and not with animals extinct. And I I promise that we'll do everything we can. I believe it is possible if we all come together and work together. You know, in the pandemic, we were outdoors so much more. We drove less. We enjoyed outdoor spaces more. And everybody felt a lot better for it in very many ways. So we have a lot to thank our planet for. And I think that I think now is the time for us to, you know, give something back. Laura Tobin. And you can find out more details of her book, Everyday Ways to Save the Planet, by following her on Twitter, at Laura Tobin one With warmer conditions and Easter holidays upon us, many may be tempted to take a little R&R at the beach. For hardy souls planning to take to the water, here's a few safety pointers, courtesy of the RNLI. With our annual beach safety campaign, we're particularly advising paddle boarders to ideally take someone else with them, to wear a buoyancy aid and a leash, and to take a means of communication. So ideally a mobile phone in a waterproof pouch, and to generally check the conditions before they go. As an organisation, we are really strongly advising people not to take dinghies, inflatable unicorns, flamingos, whatever else you can buy now. Um, They're really designed for the swimming pool and they are extremely prone to the wind. It's very, very easy to get on an inflatable and to get taken out to sea. If you do fall into cold water, try your absolute best to relax and to float on your back for those few seconds until your breathing calms down and you regain control of your muscles. If you're on the beach and you see someone who you think might be in difficulty, call 999 and ask for the Coast Guard. They're the government agency that coordinate the RNLI lifeboats, lifeguards in the UK. Key message is be prepared, be aware, and we really hope people can come 
and enjoy the UK beaches because they're absolutely stunning and it would be fantastic to see people out using our coastline. Henry Irvin of the RNLI. With the latest details of how the weather's fixed for the long weekend, here's Stephen Keats. The Easter weekend, not looking too bad for most of us. Some warmth to be had, one or two showers, but as we go on through the weekend, progressively turning a bit more settled from the west. Showers across Northern Ireland then will tend to fizzle out through the evening, but one or two breaking out across parts of Northern England into Southern Scotland. These will push their way further north this evening into Saturday morning to sit across Eastern Scotland for the first part of Saturday. Elsewhere though, it is a drier picture, variable amounts of clouds and mist and mercury turning to some Southern and Western coast, probably clearest towards Eastern England. And here, the lowest temperatures, six or seven Celsius. So not a particularly cold start to Saturday then. Quite a bit of cloud around for some of us, some sunshine for others, so it's a bit of a mixed bag. Southern and western coast a bit grey and misty. On the whole, this will tend to burn back in to the coast. And even here, I think it will see some sunny spells at times of the day. But the best of the sunshine, for the most, most part, will be inland with some fair weather cloud bubbling up, maybe the odd shower. And again, reasonable warmth to be had, 18 to 20 degrees, perhaps not quite as high as what we'll see today, but still pretty good for the time of year. So Saturday set fair, then the odd shower possible for, on the whole some sunshine, progressively turning a bit cloudy, a bit cool, a bit wetter as we move through Sunday and Monday. And as it does so, those temperatures will come back down to the mid-teens. Take care. We've heard about a new weather-related book, but now for something considerably older. The National Meteorological Library and Archive holds a unique collection of meteorological objects and documents, some of which date back many centuries. And in the second of our series, Exploring the Collection, we hear about a very special tome. Illuminated Manuscript, 1290. This is the oldest object in the National Meteorological Archive. It measures around 15 centimetres by 20 centimetres. Externally, it's nothing very special to look at, with an aged and rather nondescript greyish-green cover. The inside is a whole different story, with beautifully neat, handwritten Latin text and wonderful illuminated letters detailed in bright reds and blues. The manuscript was created by the Austrian bishop Albertus Magnus. The title, De Negotio Naturali, translates as On Natural Business, and in it, Magnus discusses many aspects of the natural world as he understood them at the time. The text is in medieval Latin and contains several beautifully illuminated letters. 1290 was long before the invention of the printing press, and so copies of works such as this would have been written out by hand by monks. Magnus experimented with reflection and refraction of light, and in the book he notes that raindrops must be perfectly spherical in order to create rainbows. This is a significant achievement when you consider that Magnus was writing 400 years before Isaac Newton first split light in 1672. Other remarkable things Magnus concluded in the book are that the speed of light is infinite and that the Milky Way must be a collection of stars. This again was long before the invention of the telescope. Magnus really was one of the greatest thinkers of his time and that contributed to him being elected patron saint of natural scientists. Dr. Catherine Ross, Senior Archivist at the National Meteorological Library and Archives. And you can see pictures of Albertus Magnus' manuscript and discover more items held in the archive by visiting metoffice.gov.uk forward slash research. Just before we go, here with a roundup of last week's UK weather extremes, Neve Murray. Here are the weather extremes for the week beginning Monday the 4th of April. The warmest place was Frithedon in Kent, where 16 degrees Celsius was recorded on Tuesday the 5th. The coldest temperature was recorded on Sunday the 10th of April, when Sennybridge in Powys hit a chilly minus 6 degrees. Sunniest place was Weybourne in Norfolk, which enjoyed 11.4 hours on Friday. 
Finally, the wettest place was Rasalak in the Scottish Highlands, where 47.6 millimetres was recorded on Monday. Thanks, Neve. That's it for Weather Snap. I'm Alex Deakin. The producer was Adrian Holloway. Weather Snap is a podcast by the UK Met Office. For the latest weather conditions where you are, download the Met Office Weather app.